I know that's an inflammatory title, but now that you're here, you can learn about some museology, a very underrated topic on YouTube. So, hey, Cypher here. Museums are an important and oft-forgotten part of the history profession. These institutions are key factors in how locales understand and interpret their own existence. There are huge responsibilities that come with that public service. Museum work is a noble task worthy of praise, but that cannot blind us to the problems that arise from taking on that goal. Some abuse that in favor of affirming their core biases, and it takes a keen eye to find it. Now, I practically grew up in museums, and of course, am a historian myself. I'm a weird guy, I work in a museum. So I've developed a critical eye for exhibition, and I hope you guys can do the same by discussing two museums I visited that had a particularly easy to spot bent. Those two institutions being the Alamo and Nixon Library. And you can guess, both are fairly good examples of this problem, which teaches us something deeper about how history is written. Along the way, perhaps you can learn about what museums do and why they are an integral part of society. Thanks to viewers like you and MyHeritage for sponsoring this video. MyHeritage is a genealogy service which can help you research your family background. They can match with other people's genealogies and the over 19 billion records that they have digital access to. In this episode, I'm talking about museums and my father was a museum director for many decades. So I started exploring his family line. It took me only a few hours before I was able to trace my family name back centuries. Just going patrilineally, the Pattons have a lineage going all the way back to at least the 14th century, including an Elizabethan historian. So I guess the history gene skipped 12 generations or so. There's problems with the precision there, as anything going back that far does. But my heritage helps to find those discrepancies which you can iron them out with further research. Generally, I don't put much credence in lineages that far back, for what matters most is the stories you have that can only go back a few generations. But it's pretty cool to be able to print a family chart like this. They can also enhance, colorize, and animate old pictures. We're all related if you look deep enough, but you can also use their archive to research individuals outside your immediate tree. So there's a lot to do with their service, and you can get a free two-week trial with the link below. And once that trial period is over, you'll get 50% off from there. So go check them out, and on with the show. First, let's talk about what a museum is. And the next 20 callers will get this album of museum noises. Now your music room can sound just like the Metropolitan Museum in New York. There are other types of museums than ones devoted to purely history, such as art and science. But the one thing that unifies them is that they collect artifacts, maintain them for posterity, and exhibit a fraction of those. A museum is essentially an archive with exhibits. They serve a public purpose of preservation first and exhibition second. As such, they must be a non-profit organization to be a museum. There are plenty of attractions that claim to be museums, but are for-profit or do not preserve artifacts for posterity, so they aren't museums. Once again, they must preserve artifacts and exhibit a few of them. That's what a museum is. They serve their community by interpreting items through exhibition and protect their collections in perpetuity. The American Alliance of Museums states in its core standards, the museum is a good steward of its resources held in the public trust. The museum identifies the communities it serves and makes appropriate decisions in how it serves them. The museum has a clear understanding of its mission and communicates why it exists and who benefits as a result of its efforts. All aspects of the museum's operations are integrated and focused on meeting its mission. 
All museums have a mission statement, and everything they do is supposed to revolve around fulfilling it. To understand what purpose a museum serves, it's best to look up that statement. So with both of the museums in question, what are their mission statements? Let's go chronologically, starting with the Alamo. Their mission is to preserve the Alamo, the shrine of Texas liberty, and bring its own unique story to life. To inspire visitors and honor all those who lived, fought, and died here. You can tell from that statement they have a particularly celebratory mission. Requiring triumphalism means they will purposefully avoid history that tarnishes that narrative. Of course, bringing its own unique story to life means that it would have to bring up those things, so their mission statement is actually inherently contradictory. But the key part is that triumphalism, and that was pretty obvious from both of the visits I made there, even though there was a significant difference between when I saw it in 2018 and 2022, which made me want to make this video in the first place. Interestingly, the Alamo had regressed between these visits, so let me explain. In a report I wrote from my first visit, I said, The Alamo is trying to project a new interpretation of the site. They can only do so subtly because it is a contested interpretation, and has only recently been implemented. They are subverting expectations of triumphalism by broadening the context of racial diversity. Unfortunately, I couldn't take any photos inside that time because of their rules of reverence an abominable way to control visitor behavior. But I do have that report from 2018 to compare. That reverence policy changed when I came back for the Western Historical Association's conference in 2022. The difference between the two times clearly showed that they were avoiding some of the interpretive subversion that the 2018 visit showed. So, what makes the Alamo so contested? It's an old Spanish mission that became a barracks during the Mexican period. When Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana came north to halt the revolt in Texas, he took San Antonio. The local garrison held out for a couple weeks before getting wiped out. Another couple weeks later, the Mexican army massacred over 400 prisoners at Goliad. That atrocity and the memory of the last stand at the Alamo drove the Texans to regroup and defeat Santa Ana at San Jacinto, routing and killing even more Mexicans than they had of Texans. Now, I've already covered these events in a previous episode, but more interesting is what happens later at the Alamo. For the most part, the site got neglected. It became a U.S. Army barracks for a few decades, being abandoned in 1876. Then it became the backdrop building of a mercantile firm until 1904, when the Daughters of the Republic of Texas, or simply DRT, bought it with a loan from local philanthropist Clara Driscoll. President Roosevelt gave a speech there in 1905, somewhat inaugurating DRT control of the site. The DRT tried to lease the long barracks to an outside firm, which is actually where the final stand took place. In protest, Adina Amelia de Zavala, who was the granddaughter of a Texas revolutionary, shut herself in against a sheriff trying to evict her from the barracks for three days in 1908. She successfully got the building kept in public hands, despite Driscoll attempting to make a profit for the organization. The DRT became increasingly anti-Hispanic as the nation as a whole became more xenophobic, passing the 1924 Quota Act severely limiting Latino immigration. For instance, they placed the Cenotaph in 1940 that had a list of defenders from Amelia Williams, which was grossly inaccurate and purposefully avoided Hispanic names. When Zavala died in 1955, the DRT refused to let her lay in state in the mission. That's how fractious the group had become. The Alamo and its memory was often used as a shorthand for anti-Hispanic sentiment. In the 1990s, a series of problems with upkeep proved that the DRT was neglecting their duties. The controversy got them to change some of the site's interpretation, to include stuff about mission neophytes and emphasize some of the archaeological work throughout the area. This controversy with upkeep in that was revived in 2010 when an investigation proved that they had been mismanaging funds, leading to the transfer of ownership to Texas as a whole. 
Ever since then, they have swayed between more inclusive interpretation and removal of that greater context. The interior of the main chapel remains relatively unchanged, but the outside is fair play for this contest over perspective. So, from all that, we can surmise four pressure points of interpretation. Hispanic inclusion, neophytes from the Spanish period, the existence of slavery, and use of the location as a symbol. Only one of those is actually applied by agreement of the DRT from both of my visits. They highlight much of the history of the mission prior to its abandonment in 1793. Now, neither time had any mention of slavery whatsoever, including issues related to slavery that contributed to Texian frustrations in 1835 and the use of the buildings by Confederates, which that rebellion was obviously motivated by the preservation of slavery. Now, I will point out that it's become a bit of a myth that the Texas Revolution was mostly to preserve their slaves, something one of the books in my bibliography is particularly bad at. But it was nonetheless a significant factor, just not a primary cause. Also, neither visit had any interpretation of how the Alamo has been used as a symbol. Instead, they actually perpetuate some of that mythology through the various tributes throughout the site, none of which have any recontextualization. I'm not a fan of removing monuments when they can just be recontextualized, but you have to recontextualize them. As one author writes, those who live in San Antonio see the Alamo as a combination of holy shrine, battle site, tourist attraction, and political carnival. They see the martyrdom of Bowie, Crockett, and Travis, as well as the Alamo's shadowy side. As in the relentless pitting of Anglos against Mexican Americans, the obsession with blood lineage, and the confusion between sentimentality and realism. Honesty requires exploring those deeper issues, but obsequiousness to the Alamo myth means they're unwilling to. The interesting difference between my visits was Hispanic inclusion. When I went there in 2018, there was plenty of information throughout. There was also a specific panel in one of the halls about the Mexican perspective of the battle. They even had some information about how Tejanos were persecuted and excluded afterward. When I returned in 2022, none of that remained. Instead, they doubled down on tiny and honestly insignificant details from the battle. They kept the stuff about Hispanics who were on the Texas side, but only portrayed Santa Ana's force as invaders, a distinctly partisan stance given it was a rebellion. They were trying to defeat a rebellion. Duh. You can't invade your own country. No historian worth their salt would say the British invaded America in 1775. This invasion narrative is an obvious attempt to associate the attack of the Alamo with illegal immigrants today, a distinctly prejudicial interpretation commonly used to drum up anti-Hispanic sentiment. Regardless of Mexican brutality, they were not invaders. This erasure perpetuates the anti-Hispanic mythology of the Alamo and directly violates their mission statement to bring the Alamo's own unique story to life. Beyond that specific problem, it also hinders the community of Texas as a whole, which it's supposed to serve. Roughly 40% of Texans are Hispanic, let alone the more than 12% black residents who get no representation through avoidance of the issue of slavery throughout the site altogether. But you also have to understand that they are required by that mission statement to maintain a triumphalist narrative despite Texas obviously losing the battle. They can recontextualize a little bit, but as long as they treat it like a shrine for Texas, rather than a historical site, that unique story and honor all of those who live, fought, and died here, which includes the more than 400 Mexican casualties during that battle, which is two or three times the amount of Texans killed will be contradictory to keeping it as a shrine to Texas Liberty. At least if they're honest with themselves. So now you see how the history of the place and museology combine to show that there is a clear disservice here. You can see that there's a path to properly criticize a museum. 
First, you establish whether it is a museum, then find their mission statement, identify the community it serves, interrogate that institution's history, and finally use that information to understand the deeper meaning of their exhibits. With this analytical eye, let's examine another institution ripe for critique, but uh, far less egregious. So firstly, when I got to the Nixon Library in 2022, they stopped me from bringing my camera inside, so I could only use my phone's camera. That's an outdated and obstinate policy to say the least. But before we get into the Nixon Library in particular, let's talk about what a presidential library is. In 1955, Congress authorized the National Archives to create libraries dedicated to, as they say, promote understanding of the presidency and the American experience. We preserve and provide access to historical materials, support research, and create interactive programs and exhibits that educate and inspire. Pretty solid mission statement right there, but that's for the entirety of the presidential library system. The Nixon Foundation established the Nixon Library in 1990, and NARA, the National Archives and Records Agency, joined them in 2007. This gave the library access to National Archives material and allowed the foundation to exert a modicum of control over the museum. In 2016, they reopened after a $15 million remodel. Their current mission statement reads, The Nixon Library's primary mission is to educate and inform. We assist all of those who search for knowledge and understanding of the 37th President of the United States, his administration, and his ongoing impact on the world. Okay, so there is a pretty strong mission statement there too, and the museum is far better than the Alamo, beyond a shadow of a doubt. They also specify their community right there. The exhibits are well-designed and aesthetically pleasing. I absolutely love the recreation of Nixon's Oval Office. They clearly have to walk a tightrope between giving proper context to Richard Nixon's legacy and appeasing his foundation. So for instance, there's a lot of things that people purposefully ignore about him in order to bash him, such as detente, opening China, ending the Vietnam War, his push for universal health care and universal basic income, the Environmental Protection Act, OSHA, and Nixon being the most pro-tribal sovereignty and Indian civil rights president the U.S. has ever had. But notice I portray all of these things as being firmly praiseworthy. None of that engages with the criticism of how he specifically handled all of those things, and the exhibits themselves largely serve to rebuff such critical context before it can even be considered. Nixon had very conniving reasons for detente and opening China. He worsened the Vietnam War by invading Cambodia. OSHA and the EPA were kind of foisted upon him, his more idealistic initiatives had no political backing, and how he often undermined the American Indian movement. Basically, every exhibit can be criticized this way. They portray the moon landing as a Nixon program despite JFK creating it. They pretend his interference in the Middle East was an unmitigated success despite abandoning the Kurds and exasperating Arab-Israeli issues. As you walk in, there's this whole setting of how crazy the 1960s were as a framing device makes Nixon seem like somehow he was fighting the madness rather than fueling it. It also has some significant and ridiculous omissions that show this problem. For all their proclaiming Nixon to be favorable to civil liberties, they avoid how he specifically impaired activists. There is nothing about his southern strategy of race-baiting rhetoric, the fight against what he called forced busing, but actually halted desegregation, and starting the war on drugs. They avoid his support of the 1973 Chilean coup against President Allende. So you can see there's a lot of stress points here, but there's one above all else that you simply can't ignore when speaking about Nixon, and that's Watergate. These other issues are omissions for the most part, which are inevitable and necessary in any telling of history. Sometimes what's not there speaks louder than what is. But of course, there is a Watergate exhibit in the library. In fact, NARA revised it in 2010 without the Nixon Foundation's permission, causing a bit of a rift, though they would eventually approve of it. Nonetheless, there are some serious issues with this place. Sprinkled throughout are little bits of text comprising the interpretation. 
For instance, they have the old evasive Nixon nonsense about other people did it too. He did that in real life, but that doesn't make it any better. There's also some teasing about the investigation into the Watergate break-in being too partisan, though luckily they don't repeat Nixon's favorite phrase of calling it a witch hunt. But still, this whole accusation of partisanship salts the interpretation with diversion and denial, which is a direct violation of their mission statement and a disservice to their community. But here it's a bit more understandable. They have to appease the Nixon Foundation, and it's only a little bit of text on the wall that most people wouldn't even notice. So yeah, it's not actually too bad. It takes a keen eye to see the issues. This is not an indictment of the Nixon Library, unlike the Alamo. I don't want to castigate museums as a whole, hence why I picked such obvious ones to examine here. You can find these issues in any institution, and I hope you've learned a bit about what a museum is. Don't be uncritical, because there can be serious omissions, minor misinterpretations, and even clear disservice. But also I hope that you gained a greater appreciation of museums, and the kind of pressures that they have to deal with. This critique requires understanding museology like that. They have to follow their mission statement, serve a community, and hopefully gain a better understanding of their topic for the community as a whole, all while preserving all of their artifacts for posterity. So hopefully you now understand that and have gained a new appreciation for what museums do. They see the martyrdom of Bowie, Bowie, like the artist who actually is named after the guy, but pronounced incorrectly. Anyways, at least if they're honest with themselves, which the DRT clearly is not. Okay, that might be a bit harsh. <laughs> oh yeah, Nixon really liked his whiskey. He always drank um, uh, Blue Label, Johnny Walker. Really expensive stuff. I'm just drinking some rye whiskey, uh, Winchester rye. Suck it to me? <laughs> oh, his food dispenser just went off and he's stuck in here. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's an inflammatory title, but <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, okay, I'll let you out. <laughs> Nixon Library. Oh, King Watson. <laughs> There's a little paw coming out from under the door. <laughs> so cute. Hi there. Yes. Oh, thank you. Oh, lots of kitty kisses. Meow. Now what? 